commands, examples, and necessary inferences, or CENI is the uh, acronym there. CENI has been used my entire life, I suppose, as a characterization of one way. I was, was taught the way, but now I've come to realize it's one way of explaining how we derive spiritual authority when we're reading the Bible. How do we know what the Bible is trying to tell us to do? How do we know how to respond to it? When the Bible says obey, what does that mean? How do we go about finding God's will for our lives uh, by reading the Bible? Well, the understanding is you look for commands or just statements of fact, straight out kind of things. There are approved apostolic examples. That's the way that it's usually phrased, approved apostolic examples. And then there are necessary inferences that we can draw. Shorthand, there are direct ways of communication. There are indirect ways of communication, but a a studious and a diligent and a prayerful reader of God's word can use these principles to discern what God's will is and put it to work in his life and be united with other believers in so doing. Uh, this is a, a concept that has fallen under some pretty severe fire in my lifetime. In fact, I've read two books this last week that took issue with this as a primary way of discerning God's will. The understanding is now in some quarters that we need to be more, I guess you'd say, flexible about such things, especially in light of our complete inability, it would seem, to find unity. The frustration that we see, including among people who seem to believe almost right down the line with us on certain philosophical matters, it just seems to be impossible for Christians to dwell together in unity, which is clearly God's plan for us. And maybe the problem is we have stressed the minutia of God's will to such a degree that it has become practically impossible for any significant group of people to get along. And the idea of uniting all of those who call themselves Christians under one umbrella and having us all go along and get along and having us be one big happy family is uh, appears to be impossible. I have several responses to this, this kind of notion, and we'll cover some of it here uh, today. One, and a very important one, is it is not my mission in life to make sure that everybody who names the name of Jesus Christ can get together in the same room and survive and, and have fellowship one with another. That's not my mission. That's Jesus Christ's mission, and he is accomplishing it in his way, as I understand it, through the text. Again, some people may disagree with, on, with me on that, but, but the way I have always understood it is that when we come to God's will, we come to God's word with an open heart, desiring that he move us in his way, that he is capable of doing that, and it seems to me, although maybe it seems a little argumentative to say so, that we are severely limiting the power of God by suggesting that our stubbornness, our willfulness, is somehow going to keep Jesus from doing what he said he was going to do. I, I, I don't believe that. I believe Jesus is fully capable of doing that. The, bo the bottom line is, though, the, the fact remains, it is exceedingly difficult, if not impossible, to get large groups of people, broad swaths of fellowship, you might say, to, uh, to agree on a way to take the Bible. And one very increasingly popular position to take is it really doesn't matter that much. And the way that it was, that's been phrased in different terminology, depending on who's selling the book, the terminology is going to change, but uh, I'm, I'm going to use the term the core gospel. That's one phrase that's thrown out a lot. There is a concept among some that God is communicating a broad picture to us through the Bible and that all of the aspects of God's will, the history, the poetry, the, the prophecy, all of this, and particularly the life of Jesus, is feeding into this big picture and informing us of God's nature and God's plan and our role in all of these things. And by seeing 
the, the big picture, we, we come to understand better what God's will is for our lives. And, and I agree with all of that. I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. The implication, though, is, and, and sometimes it's not an implication, that if something touches the core of the gospel closely, if something is, you know, kind of zooms right in on something that's important, something that's core, something that, that touches the nature of God and his dealings with humanity, if it's an application that, that emphasizes that, then that's an important application. And if it is seems to be tangential, if it does not seem to have anything to do with anything, it's just a rule, well, likely that was given in the immediate context of the first century church of the Old Testament, that it really doesn't have anything to do with the big picture, and that we can more or less filter that out uh, as society evolves, we can evolve away from these, these applications. That sounds an awful lot to me like doing whatever you want to do, and maybe that's a cynical way of, of looking at it here. I don't want to get into all the weeds with regard to my, my philosophical difficulties with, with these things and, and uh, the, the holes in these arguments, and, and this could take weeks and weeks and weeks, and I'm not going to do that. But what I would like to do is concede 75% or so, of the argument that's being made on the other side. I will concede that the Bible is complicated. I will concede that there are cultural aspects in the Bible that are not touching on the core of the gospel. I will concede that there are certain representations of obedience that you see in the New Testament that are cultural in their origin and that are not intended to be applied across the board to Christians of all uh, ages and, and nationalities and times. I, I will say this, though. I suspect, and this is where I may get in trouble with some, so bear with me on this. I suspect that there is, in many quarters, I don't want to say in every quarter, in many quarters there is an agenda here. That this is not so much a matter of finding out what God's will is for the church today and throughout time, it's more, and maybe it's not even noticed, maybe it's, it's subconscious, but it, at its core, it's more about us finding a rationale for doing what we've already decided we're going to do, and something that the Bible specifically prohibits. Again, I don't want to get into this. Uh, there, there are a lot of arguments that we can have along these lines with regard to, say, instrumental music or the number of times we're to partake of the Lord's Supper, things of that nature, that are vague at best in the New Testament, that are not oftentimes specifically addressed, that I have in times past used CENI to infer from the text the best way to apply his principles, the best way to find ourselves in compliance with his will. I don't want to get into any of that today. What I do want to do is this. I want to touch on a handful of topics here that I think anybody, I hate to say that, maybe that's not fair. I would like to think that most of us, if we're being honest with ourselves, no matter what part of the spectrum we're on here, most of us would concede these are in fact core principles. These do, if anything, speaks to the nature of God and the nature of his relationship with us. These things do. And these things are also the points of conversation that are splitting fellowships all over the country and all over the world among people who claim to be following God's will, who claim to revere the Bible as God's word, and who oftentimes make these same arguments that we're talking about here that we need to, to submit to the core of the gospel. Well, this is the core of the gospel. I'm going to share just a few thoughts with you, and then our, our uh, time will be gone. But I'd like to just hand, hand, hand pick a, a few points of discussion here. Let's talk about marriage, for instance. Marriage is at the core of the gospel. We see marriage as a not only an institution given to us in the very beginning of creation, in Genesis chapter 2, but we also see it as a metaphor, Old and New Testament alike, to describe God's dealings with his people. He is our husband. We are 
given to him. We are to be faithful to him. Unfaithfulness is described as adultery to him. The nation of Israel committed fornication with all these other gods. This concept of being connected to our spiritual husband, being espoused, being devoted to him, and him being our protector and our provider, uh, this is who God is. Over and over and over again, we see this. There's a passage in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, that is, is very hotly disputed in uh, different academic circles. Uh, maybe some of it is because what it appears to say in most of the older, more established versions is not very popular. But it talks about how God hates divorce. At least that's one way of rendering the text. And uh, it's something pretty similar to that, at least if that's not it. And there is some question as to whether the divorce in question there is the divorce of husbands and wives in the flesh, or whether it's a spiritual thing, that God hates the idea of his spiritual bride fornicating. He hates the idea of finding himself in position where he has to put them away, where he has to sever fellowship. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which way to go. I will say this. The fact that we have difficulty discerning between these two points proves my point. The fact is, physical marriage and spiritual marriage are hand in glove all over the scripture. And when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 through 12, he talks about, about marriage and what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. He's not just commenting about whether it is or is not appropriate for you to divorce your wife or divorce your husband and then marry somebody else. That's not it. He's, or that's not all of it, at least. He's talking in much more broad principles about whether it is or is not okay for you to keep your commitments. And your failure to keep your marital commitments or any other kind of commitments in the flesh reflects on your commitment toward God. He has committed fully toward us. If you don't believe that, then look at the cross. And he requires the same kind of commitment from us. And when we fornicate, when we leave him, we join ourselves to someone else, we are found to be unfaithful. We're found to be adulteresses. James chapter 4 uses that terminology for people, not people who have started worshiping idols necessarily, but people who simply aren't serving God like they ought to. They love themselves too much in that situation. These are adulteresses the feminine there, because we, no matter you're male or female, if you are a child of God, you are connected to him spiritually. Why is it that we have widespread acceptance of divorce in spiritual situations now, including churches of Christ? More and more, there is a very passive attitude toward, taken toward marriage in general, divorce and remarriage in particular. Well, you know, this is the way it is. This is where people are. This is the, I think we just have to accommodate to, to match modern culture. When did it become important for us to change God's laws so it's more convenient for people who are in sin to find a home there? When has that ever been the case? When has it been God's responsibility to forgive people who habitually sin against him? That's not his responsibility. Our responsibility is to come to him, to repent of our sins, and allow him to accept us back on his terms. And of course, that's several sermons right there uh, that we don't have time to get into. But that's, that's one application here. Surely marriage is a concept that touches on the core of the gospel. Can we be in agreement that we all have to teach the same thing on marriage? That we all have to do what Jesus told us to do with regard to marriage? Clearly, the answer is no. We hear that resoundingly all over the religious spectrum. Well, I would call that hypocrisy. I would call that inconsistency. Maybe that's a kinder word there. Inconsistency. This is at the core. And if we're going to respect the core of God's message, we have to respect marriage. I'll talk about male and female leadership here as well. Another hot button. Another situation where it is assumed in, frankly, most spiritual quarters these days. 
most people who call themselves Christians think that the idea of male leadership is passe. If it was ever appropriate, it's certainly not appropriate. Now, in our modern, evolved culture, uh, we need to take all of these concepts that talk about male leadership, and there's no question that they're there. I mean, it's it's all over the scriptures, Old and New Testament alike. Well, we just have to just chunk all of those out, just get rid of them all, put them through the shredder. That is a, a first century concept. That is a skewed concept. That is a misogynistic concept. Uh, we, we just need to get rid of all of that and modernize the our concept of leadership. Well, what does the core of the gospel say? The core of the gospel says that male-female roles are rooted in heaven. They are reflective of the nature of God and the nature of God's relationship with us. They go all the way back to the beginning, just like uh, like marriage does. If, when Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33 describe the role of the husband and, and the wife, and the, the man is said that he is going to be the, the spiritual leader of this family. Why is that the case? That is the case so that marriages can teach us about the church. And that's what Paul says there in Ephesians chapter 5. This is a mystery, but I'm speaking with regard to Christ and the church. The reason that it's important, one reason at least, it's important for us to understand about male-female uh, roles in the churches because they mirror spiritual roles in heaven. Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the spiritual head. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2 and 3 emphasize this also. Men are the head of women in the same sense that God is the head of Christ and Christ is the head of the church. We don't want to, to fool around with the other two aspects of this three-headed uh, issue that we have here. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of the church. But we, we, we can't go along with this idea of men being the head of women. We're, we're beyond that. But it's rooted in the eternal truth. It's rooted in the core of the gospel. And if Ephesians chapter 5 means anything, it means that disrespect toward Jesus by his spiritual bride, a failure to submit, a failure to accept his authority, is rebellion. And, and we can get into a big, long discussion about appropriate implementation of these rules and, and abuses of the system and, and men who did their women wrong and, and cultural demonstrations of this, that, and the other and, and have a big old discussion about that, and that's fine. We can have that discussion some other time maybe. But at least let's accept in principle that the Bible says what it says. And in this particular situation, the Bible says why it's saying it. It's saying it to teach us about the church. Well, if the male-female role system is a lie, would that be an unfair choice of words? If it is time-oriented, if it was maybe sort of kind of appropriate 2,000 years ago, but not so much now, aren't we saying the same thing about Jesus? And by the way, is it an accident that a society that has less and less regard for the minutia, for the details, the personal relationships that the Bible describes with regard to implementation of God's Word, that same society takes an increasingly indifferent attitude toward the Bible. It's because we have lost the concept of authority. What authority figures is it, are, is it okay for us to ignore? We, we have to submit to Jesus, but we don't have to submit to, to husbands or parents or bosses or governments. That, that's, all, that's all flexible. Where do we get that? Because we don't get it from the Bible. And I, I understand that there is a, a pull from evangelist, uh, evangelistic types. There is a, a, an obvious draw that a more egalitarian, a more modern look at the church uh, might be more attractive, at least to some people in the world. I think that point can be overstated, but nevertheless, it's, it certainly would be the case in some quarters. And some people might buy into the idea that the gospel simply won't work in the modern world if we do things God's way. I don't believe that. I hope and pray that you don't believe that. It won't work with certain people, but that's always been the case. It's always been the case that some people would not submit to the rule of Jesus Christ. Dumbing down the gospel so that they will is not doing them any favors, it's not doing us any favors, it's not doing the church any favors, and it's not doing God any favors. I'll give you a couple of other examples. 
of a, of a modern uh, a modern type. Uh, let's talk about about men and women. Uh, let's talk about about transgenderism. Let's talk about homosexuality. Human beings are created for one another, men and women. Genesis chapter one verse twenty seven twenty eight tell us that very specifically. Male and female, he created them. And then what happens? Sometimes we, we cut verse 26 and 27 off. That's, that's God creating us in his image, and that's great. But what does verse number 28 say? What's the very first thing that these men and women were told to do? God says, be fruitful and multiply. Now think about that for a second. We're, this is a PG or PG-13 rated uh, uh, show here. We're, we're not going to get just graphic about this. But it stands to reason, or it used to, maybe not anymore, that male and female, from a genetic standpoint, from a sexual standpoint, from a social standpoint, are necessary to bring a new generation into the world. Being fruitful and multiplying is given to us in the same exact context of God making us male and female. And then there's that extended passage there in the, the Genesis chapter 2 account of the creation, how God breathed life into Adam and he became a living soul, and there was no one found that was compatible to him. And God said, I will make a helper that is meet for him, that is compatible, that works with him. And then he goes and looks at all the animals, and he can't find any. There, there's nobody there. And Adam begins to despair, it seems. And then God puts him to sleep, and he takes a rib out of his side and makes a woman out of the rib. And Adam rejoices there and calls her bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He calls her woman, not another man, not a little bit different man. She is something else. Woman who was taken out of man. This is the eternal concept of God with regard to who you are and who I am. It's always been this way. Now, I, I understand that there are psychological arguments. There are people who do not care one whit about Jesus Christ, who are telling us this, that, and something else about the way things are and the way things are now and the way things should have been, and, and on and on we can go. Whatever. I, I can't do anything about that. What I can do is this. I can say that God, from the very beginning, created human beings to be male and female. And he did that so that they would be different, so that they would be compatible, so that they would reproduce, so that they, as two becoming one, in a spiritual sense and in a physical sense, they would be able to perpetuate the species and carry on the work that God had given them to do from generation to generation. With all that in mind, how does homosexuality fit into this? Not at all. Homosexuality is an affront to this whole concept. None of it makes sense in the context of homosexuality. It's contraindicated. I don't want to get into a big genetic discussion. I don't want to get into a big social discussion. I don't want to get into uh, all the, the ad hominem arguments and, and vitriol and name calling. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we should treat any human being with anything less than respect as anything other than being made in the image of God. Because no matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing with your life, you are a child of God and you, are, uh, you have a piece of God inside of you. And if for no other reason, you deserve respect from me and from everyone else because of that. That being said, it has always been the case, ever since the Garden of Eden, that human beings do not always measure up. And so what we need to do is serve God in the capacity that he has given us. And that includes male and female capacity. If someone struggles to, to fit into a particular role, by all means, seek help. Find a way to, to make this work. But do not assume that God's rules don't work anymore simply because you have a certain feeling because you read a book somewhere or something like this. This is, at the again, at the absolute core of how God deals with human beings from the very beginning, from day one. Well, day one of humans, day six of creation. It has been this way. I, I don't know how you can turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to something that obvious. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to have any regard at all for God's plan for our lives, for our, our mission here on earth, then we have to accept 
God's plan with regard to the sexes, and we have to reject any kind of human uh, alteration, corruption, that might present some kind of alternative plan that may be popular in the moment. One other point, and then we'll, we'll close up. Let's talk about baptism. Uh, there is probably no practice, Old or New Testament, that is so overwhelmingly affirmed spiritually, contextually, historically, uh, than the idea that baptism is for remission of sins. If you want to deny that, if you want to affirm, rather, that, that any old ba baptism is okay, if you want to, to sprinkle instead of, of immerse, if you want to, to do it for, for this reason instead of that reason or, or whatever, you're ignoring what the Bible says. The, the Bible clearly says that baptism is not just a box you have to check, but rather it is a reflection of your willingness or unwillingness to submit to the plan of God. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says this is how we put on Christ. This is when we put on Christ. Romans chapter 6, verse 4 talks about how we're buried with him in baptism into death. Like as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, uh, so also we might walk in newness of life. I've seen an increased emphasis on baptism, including immersion baptism, in many spiritual quarters in my lifetime, and, and that's great. People have... have grown tired of pretending like the Bible doesn't say what it says. That's great, and, and let's hope that trend continues. But for those who, who haven't bought in yet, for those who think that baptism is an add-on, that it's uh, nothing more than an outward expression of an inward grace, or however you want to phrase it these days, you need to read your Bible. You need to go back to the basics. You need to understand what God has said from the beginning, not just about what you need to do or what a bunch of people did, in times past, but why this is done. This, again, touches at the very core of what it means to be a creation of God and a recreation of God. We are given any number of rationales. I mentioned two. You could, you could go to Jesus' own baptism, that he, to be an obedient one, to, to be a partaker of all things that are righteous, he had to be baptized. I don't know how I could manage to avoid being baptized if my Lord and Savior had to be baptized. And on and on we can go. This is not a baptism sermon particularly. But uh, if, if we regard spiritual principles, if we regard the things that touch at the heart of what it means to be a human being and what it means to be created by the Creator, what it means to be born again, if I may use that expression, then surely we have to accept the idea that baptism is for remission of sins. We're told that over and over again. It, it basically comes down to, and I don't want to just oversimplify this, but that's this is what it is. It comes down to a question of whether you are or are not willing to submit to God's will. God is going to be the judge of us all. And as I mentioned before, some of the, the particulars with regard to doctrinal matters, procedural matters, the best way to carry this out, whether this is actually a binding example or a necessary inference, etc., uh, that can be touchy and and. Autonomous churches are, are a wonderful thing. If you are in Chicago or New York City or Hong Kong or whatever it happens to be, and the church there decides to do things differently than the church in Georgetown, we'll all answer to Jesus Christ one of these days. That's, it's not my job to make sure you toe the line appropriately. It is my job to read the Bible, to do what it says, and to encourage you to do exactly the same thing. So I urge you to reject these shallow arguments that a lot of people will make to try to convince you that it's something other than just doing what the Bible says. If you will commit yourself to reading the Bible and following the will of God that you find there, I, I really believe that God will find a way to work his will in your life. He will figure out the details, and with his help, you'll figure out the details. Uh, the, the first step is the hardest, just like, you know, <laughs> just like jumping off a cliff, right? The first step is going to be the hardest. This is the first step, the, the biggest step of faith. Do you agree to submit to Jesus Christ in every aspect, including when it seems like it's not appropriate or it's not popular or it's not what the preacher says or anything such as that, including, you know, by the way, when we're talking about what the preacher says, continue to read your Bible on your own. Don't just take my word for it. Study for yourself. Pray uh, to the Lord for wisdom and for guidance and trust that he will show you his way through the word. I hope and pray that this is the case, that you are going to 
grow in your understanding and your commitment to following God and doing his things in his way and ultimately finding a home in heaven. Thank you very much for following along. God bless.